So let's go ahead and get started. So to provide a context again, if you want the full context, this is a webinar on STEMRAD's radiation shield, which is called the 360 Gamma. My name is Cody Cole, and I am joined by STEMRAD's Robert Puso, and we're going to be discussing some of the fundamental features of the device, as well as the logic that goes behind the protection that it provides. Berkeley Nucleonics as a company has become more invested, especially with COVID making everything remote briefly and providing educational resources in the form of these presentations, as well as online courses on our Berkeley Nucleonics Academy in the subjects of radiation detection identification, RF and microwave equipment, as well as precision timing technologies. A lot of this can be found on either our YouTube channel or on our main webpage. But with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over and uh, let's get started. Thank you very much, Cody. As he uh, mentioned, my name is Robert Busso. I'm the Director for Business Development for STEMRAD North America. And uh, I joined the company in 2016, right after retiring from the United States Army as an Explosive Ordnance Disposal Technician. The uh, thing about EOD is we primarily focus on explosive hazards, but we are well trained in chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats as well. Additionally, some of my key assignments to specifically like technical escort unit on Aberdeen Proving Grounds and the 20 Support Command really focused me towards the radiation space. And why that's important is when I retired, a good friend decided to introduce me to the CEO for Samurad, Dr. Oren Milstein, who talked to me about his innovation of selective shielding. And I was really taken back by the approach to making humans more radiation resistance. As a bomb tech, I am used to wearing something over my face, over my head, a bomb suit, a protective mask, a helmet, to really get safe. And this, this is a waste-worn kit that really changed the perspective on how we look at radiation. Now, the focus of STEMRAD is to make humans more radiation resistant. It's not a super suit, it doesn't do everything. But this, this small company, which was stood up in 2011, right after Fukushima, has that solitary goal to make it safer for us to work in radiation environments. Now, the quote from Professor McVitie you see on the board really sums it up. STEMRAD has made shielding from penetrating radiation possible. And that's what we're going to discuss. Our goal at STEMRAD is to address radiation safety across the entire spectrum. That's responding to terrorism, nuclear accidents, nuclear confrontation, space exploration, and medical, and, you know, operationally and through emergencies. So a lot of times we'll run into people when we do these presentations that say that they're not going to go into high-risk radiation environments. The EPA PAGs, the Protective Action Guides, also lean that way, that 25 REM line, where the concept is you just don't go towards that radiation. But we know that's not true. People in emergency response run into danger. We've seen that demonstrated at Chernobyl. We've seen it at Fukushima. We saw it in Twin Towers. We've even seen it on the small scale. The SL-1 reactor meltdown in Idaho Falls. Uh, not a lot of risk to the community, yet a full response. People go into the high hazard radiation environments. So that's really important that we focus on that. And I'm going to talk a lot about these low volume, high risk catastrophes. but it's also important to understand that this application is good for those operational, those low doses that you get over time. Now, this is a quick overview of radiation that we see on Earth, what the earthbound threat to help us frame the talk a little bit. We have alpha particles, which are easily stopped by a sheet of paper or a couple layers of dead skin tissue. We have beta, which can be stopped by plastic or your full enclosure hazmat suits. And then you have the gamma photons, which is the primary focus of our discussion. Those photons can be attenuated by dense materials such as lead. Some can still get through, but that attenuation will reduce the dose that's penetrating that lead. Now, when we look at protection today from radiation, this is actually an image of a Fukushima firefighter with his kit. He's got the full body hazmat suit, 
which I said will block the alpha and the beta from contacting the skin, giving those burns and blistering. And then he wears a respirator to stop the ingestion and inhalation. But there is no protection from that gamma radiation. All that penetrating radiation is still impacting his body. So when we talk about radiation workers and we look at when we might experience uh, meaningful high dose radiation, there's high dose reactor activities, there's abhorrent dose readings. And that's simply when your modeling doesn't match the environment, possibly because of weathering and the materials are moved by rain and wind. Or if you have a detector that's compromised, a broken detector, so you don't really know what the readings are. And then more importantly, emergency response. And we saw a good example of emergency response when we were able to participate in one of the annual exercises at the St. Lucie reactor in Florida. They had a simulated situation where the reactor was in meltdown and it was hitting 10,000 R an hour. And regardless of the physical impact on the emergency responders in that situation, they're going to go in. They're going to attempt to mitigate that meltdown because if they don't, they'll lose containment and it will be detrimental to the surrounding communities, the environment, the food chain. So regardless of the situation, they're going to go in and try to stop that meltdown. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the way to attenuate that, that gamma energy, those gamma rays, is through thick lead. But if you look at the image of this, this poor bunny being squished by this metal ball, the amount of lead you would need to wear in a full body suit would weigh several hundred pounds to get any kind of measure protection. The problem with that is you're not operationally capable. You can't move down range wearing hundreds of pounds of kit. And it will also stretch your time down range, which violates that time distance shielding rule that we like to use. So we have to look at what the impact of this gamma radiation is so we can address it in a more meaningful and functional manner. So if you look at this chart from the CDC, it breaks down the primary cause of death from different exposure levels. This physiological response is known as acute radiation syndrome or acute radiation sickness, ARS. And it's historically identified as exposure to doses of radiation greater than 50 centigrade. It's been typically subdivided into three sub-syndromes, hematopoietic syndrome, gastrointestinal, and neurological, failure of the neurological, neurovascular system, excuse me. Additionally, radiation exposure can lead to multi-organ dysfunction. Now, further study identified the root cause or the, the organs that fail. And what we're going to focus on is stem cells because they're most susceptible to ionizing radiation. We're going to come back to this slide in a minute. But let's look at those stem cells a little bit more. These hematopoietic stem cells make up your red bone marrow and are found in your long bones and your pelvis. And their function is they create your blood system, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets. They give you the ability to stop bleeding, halt infection, and oxygen exchange. Now, in regards to that syndrome, that hematopoietic syndrome, excuse me, the laboratory studies have been done that conducted, conducted excuse me, direct exposure of mice, unprotected mice to gamma radiation. And it was shown that at doses less than 100 centigrade, those hematopoietic systems would regenerate on their own. The red bone marrow, enough of it survived so the system could regrow and before they succumbed, their blood system would be back online. At doses higher than 100 centigrade, some of the patients, some of the mice required some growth accelerators like Neupogen, and those would help those hematopoietic cells reproduce at a faster rate. At doses between 450 and 600 centigrade, without a bone marrow transplant, all those patients would die. They just couldn't recover enough bone marrow to produce the blood cells in a timely manner. 
Gastrointestinal syndrome and neurovascular syndrome, which also occur to exposure to gamma radiation, start at about 1500 centigrade and 2000 centigrade respectively. While not a lot is known about neurovascular, just the, the function of it, neurovascular syndrome, gastrointestinal syndrome leads to diarrhea, sepsis, infection, and death. And that's because of the loss of the stem cells lining your gastrointestinal system. At that point, the infections can't be overcome because you've completely eliminated your red bone marrow. So there are no white blood cells being made. There are no red blood cells being made and you start to hemorrhage because you don't have any platelets. Minor nausea and vomiting can occur at doses less than 100 centigrade, but can typically treat it with serotonin blockers. Additionally, blistering of your skin and temporary hair loss can occur at 300 and 400 centigrade. But again, temporary hair loss. The most important thing is that if we maintain some of that red bone marrow, we increase the chance for survival. And that's that's a key note because we get a lot of comments on this. This is not a super solution that will stop you from getting impacted from radiation. What it does is it increases your survivability and your radiation resistance. So as I mentioned, the stem cells are very susceptible to radiation, but the mature blood cells, the red cells, the white cells, and the platelets are a lot more resistant. So what happens is after that initial exposure, you know, you, you get those symptoms of the illness, and then you'll come to a latent, latent phase where most of the patients seem otherwise healthy. That's because they still have those blood cells performing their natural functions, blood clot, treating infections, oxygen exchange. But as those mature cells naturally die off from age, then you start to see the impact of not having that, that bone marrow. There's no replication of those cells, so then you succumb you know, within a couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending on your dosage. So it's obvious that bone marrow has the most critical role in maintaining those lives. And to validate that concept, we're gonna look at the exposures from Chernobyl. These are 23 firefighters that were exposed between 290 and 1100 centigrade. As you can see from the uh, quote from the UNSCAR report, the primary cause of death, underlying cause, was the loss of bone marrow. And, and why it's underlined is the important factor is that a lot of these guys died from infections to beta burns, injuries that their bodies could not self-recover because they didn't have that hematopoietic system to kick in. They'd lost too much bone marrow, even at 290 centigrade, to self-recover. Now, a lot of transplants were attempted, but because of the emergency situation, there were no matching donors. This brings us to an important question about bone marrow. What is the minimal fraction of bone marrow that must survive the radiation exposure in order to allow survival of the individual? So we'll give you a couple seconds to take a look at this and, and give a guess. You should have a pop-up now. If you missed the pop-up or accidentally dismissed it, it's in the poll section on the chat side. For those of us who are joining us a bit later before the introduction, there are also the handouts if you want to catch up on some of the information we might have uh, already pushed through. Give them about uh, 10 more seconds here. All right, uh, let's go ahead and show that answer. Okay, so 2.5%, which what that means is that 2.5% of your total body mass of red bone marrow needs to survive so you can self-recover. That on your own, you don't need Neupogen at that point. You don't need these growth accelerators to survive. They'll help because it'll accelerate the growth. But that's a lot lower than I would suspect most people thought. It seems a little far-fetched. So to address that, we're going to look at leukemia patients and the treatment we give to them because it falls right in line. Leukemia, if you don't know, is a blood-borne or a bone marrow-borne disease. And the treatment for that is to hit the patient with a high-dose radiation, sometimes as high as 1,400 centigrade, to kill off all of their red bone marrow. 
basically it provides a flush of their system, gives you a clean palate. And then we take a matching donor and take approximately 5% of the body mass of red bone marrow from their pelvis and iliac crest. And 5% is the safe side, that 2.5% that number. But that injection is given to the patient and through the miracle of the human body, all those cells migrate to those long bones in the pelvis and regenerate the system. And they can do it in a timely enough manner so there's no, there's no fatality from loss of that blood system. Now, it's important to note where we take it from. Take it from the pelvis because that's where adults have approximately 50% of their body's bone marrow. So that's a giant store. Now, that really wraps up the idea of what selective shielding is. If you can see this vest, it selectively shields that bone marrow. We're going to watch a short video that kind of talks about it a little bit more before we kick into the products. By layering proven protection materials precisely over critical stem cell concentrations, the STEMRAD 360 Gamma dramatically increases user survivability in highly radioactive environments. The stem cells are then able to exit the shielded area and replenish the whole body, allowing the individual to recover from radiation exposure. I had experience uh, dealing with the victims of the Chernobyl nuclear accident. This was in 1986. Uh, the victims uh, were firemen who responded uh, to the emergency and ended up getting very high doses of radiation to their whole body. Uh, this resulted in severe suppression of their bone marrow function and we call pancytopenia, low levels of white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets. Uh, this proved to be life-threatening and sadly many of them died from that exposure. The STEMRAD company has uh, made a device that can shield the bone marrow from the lethal effects of radiation. This would potentially save a person from this type of, of severe radiation injury. STEMRAD's first product that actually implements this, this concept of selectively shielding is called the STEMRAD 360 Gamma. And like it says, it gives 360 degree protection from gamma radiation. Now, the design itself, it weighs approximately 30 pounds, depending on the size, slight fluctuation, and it provides a 2.5 fold protection level. The impressive results were validated by the Department of Energy through the Pacific Northwest National Lab. The design is relatively simple. As you can see, it's sheets of lead with Teflon in a very comfortable belt that rests on your hips and is stabilized by those shoulder straps. Uh, the idea is that it kind of dissolves in how you carry your equipment. You know, it's, it makes it operationally sound. You'll also notice that there's different thickness on the lead. Uh, you might wonder why we didn't just put an inch thick of lead around the person, because that's about 70 pounds and it doesn't really impact the meaningfulness of the protection because this is right sized for its functionality. If you recall, I mentioned gastrointestinal and neurological syndromes that occur at 1500 and 2000, 2000 centigrade respectively. If you add more density to the lead, more thickness to the lead to protect the red bone marrow, yes, you'll reduce the radiation that marrow is exposing, and you might be able to maintain some of it a little bit longer. But you'll hit that dose threshold where that marrow won't matter as much because you'll be impacting your other systems and go into multi-organ failure as well. So it's not meaningful. It's just be extra weight downrange. Now, at STEMRED, we like to let the numbers talk for itself. So when you look at this study from 1967, what they did is they took puppies and they shielded with a small amount of lead their mass of bone marrow. And they hit them with three times the median lethal dose, about 1,000 R. And they showed that these puppies survived. It was interesting, but it actually grew out of previous research. Uh, from what I understand, they were testing rats to see if they could identify what the lethal dose for gamma radiation was. And they were hitting these rats with a collimated beam, but they weren't dying, even though they were hitting them with massive doses of radiation. They found out 
that the tails were sticking out of the cages and the vertebrae that was not getting hit by the, the radiation had enough bone marrow, bone marrow in it to regrow their entire system and let them survive. So the concept itself is pretty solid that as long as you focus on that bone marrow below a thousand centigrade, you increase that chance of survivability substantially. In more recent study on primates, you can see the same response. Instead of shielding, what they did is they spared some of the bone marrow from radiation exposure. Now, now primates in this study are already more radiation resistant than humans, but you can see, but just shielding 5% of their bone marrow, they were able to increase that protection level, make them significantly more radiation resistant. Now, the growth accelerators that I mentioned earlier, uh, this would be a perfect example. As long as you maintain a portion of that red bone marrow post-exposure, you can accelerate that growth. But the key is you have to protect that marrow, either through sparing or preferred case, shielding it, so you have something to regrow. If there's no bone marrow left, it doesn't matter what you do. Without a matching donor, they will not survive. Now, up until now, I've been addressing the deterministic, you know, cause leading to effect, radiation exposures, ARS. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about st stochastic impacts. These are the long-term cancers that happen by chance. Now, because of where you wear the vest, you also incidentally protect these key organs that are susceptible to radiation exposure and cancer. So protecting your ovaries, your colon, your bladder, your stomach, has the impact of reducing the chance that you're gonna get those long-term cancers. I mean, 35%, it's a great reduction. And this is where you really focus on those low dose continual exposures. If you're a radiation worker, you know they've shown as low as 100 microsieverts can lead to a cancer. You wear this shielding, protect yourself, add to your radiation resistance at a meaningful manner, while not eliminating your capability, your operational functionality to move around. So this is a good point. I, I talked about the exercise we participated in at St. Lucie, where the reactor was putting out 10,000 R an hour in this simulated scenario. Now, for the emergency teams to mitigate this meltdown, for them to go in there and stop it, they had to enter a adjoining room that was at 900 R an hour. They would go in there, set up pumps, help mitigate the meltdown. They were able to show by wearing STEM Red 360 gammas that they could reduce their dose sufficiently so they could complete the operations and have zero radiation-reduced fatalities. Additionally, greatly reducing their long-term cancer risks. Following that exercise, their parent company immediately purchased the kit and outfitted their emergency response teams. Now, in order to better facilitate different types of responses, we looked at different configurations of the vest. Uh, came up with the 360 Light, which was uh, co-funded by TISWIG, the Technical Support Working Group. And what this is, it's a vest that's designed for more tactical situations. Uh, think about your Special Forces teams, FBI, and especially the Explosive Ordnance Disposal guys going down range. It provides a little more versatility, less protection from cloud sources, but a little more versatility in mission aspect. And it weighs about 30% about less. Now, if you look at the scenarios that we considered the application for, it still functions as a protection from cloud source, reducing your dose. But really the focus on is the ability to use it against a point source. And how you do this is, skip forward here. It's a reversible vest that fits under your bomb suit. And if you're wearing it in the cloud source configuration, the biggest mass of lead is against your back, pressed tightly against your pelvis and your iliac crest. That's where the mass of bone marrow is. So you get protection from the lead from the rear and the sides, but you're getting additional protection from your body mass and the lead in the front. So when you shift to a point source, 
you spin it around and where the mass of the lead in your stomach. We go back to this EOD tech on the right. You can see that he's working with a radiological source. He has that lead between him and the source. And gamma radiation, consider it just like a flashlight shining at that lead plate. It doesn't, it doesn't magic itself and turn around it. It's going to go straight to it, get attenuated, and protect the mass of that bone marrow. This is actually far superior, we'll see later on, than the 360 in protection from a point source. Now, these three slides provide an overview of the combined test results from the Israeli Ministry of Defense and from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. I'm going to talk about them uh, very briefly, just a slight overview of them, but all of this data is available. If you would like it, please request it, and we will get it to you, because the biggest role, I said, is for me to educate people on the concept of selective shielding and just show them how the evidence supports it. So the first chart we have is the peak attenuation to BM and the prevention of ARS from a cloud source. So the peak attenuation, uh, the best way to consider that is like a transmission factor if you're calculating your dose received when you're sitting inside a tank. Uh, the gamma reduces the dose 2.33 fold against a cesium-137 source. Now, uh, here it's important to point out that different radionuclides have different energy levels and they'll penetrate differently. So it's best to know what you're going against. But there will be sometimes lower, sometimes greater protection level depending on the energy level of that source. Now, the second part of this chart, the dose at which less than 32 grams viable BM remains, that's really your, your red line, your threshold, that if you exceed it, you will not have a survivable amount, that 2.5% of red bone marrow. But that takes you up to 910 centigrade, which, remember, your, your median lethal is somewhere between 350 and 400 centigrade. So it really kicks you up to a high level of protection. Now, this is another, basically an expansion of looking at the, the data a different way. Uh, the key I want to point out here is that 723 centigrade line. You can spend 19 minutes downrange working on R RDD and still have a 37% lethality, reduce your lethality 37% versus 100% for unshielded. So again, it's just another way to look at the data and understand that this makes you more radiation resistant. And I, I love saying this, I, I wanna go back to this. This is not to make you go into high dose areas. Uh, to push yourself because your leadership tells you to. This is actions you're already going to take. You're going to run into that fire. You're going to run into that, that radiation emergency. You're already going to do it. This is going to make sure that you survive it when you do it. And, and that's really our goal here, to make you more resistant to radiation. Uh, this is a very important chart. As I said, we have the light and we have the 360. And when I show both side by side. I have a lot of people that really just like the light. It's it's lighter. It makes you more maneuverable. It makes it easier to walk around. It degrades you less downrange. All absolutely true. But just like when you pick your equipment to go downrange, what respirator you're going to wear, what hazmat suit you're going to wear, you want to identify what the threat is. If you're going into a threat that is a point source, you absolutely want to have the 360 light because you can see the protection level is significantly higher from a point source than the 360 gamma. But if you're going into a cloud source, you want the heavier kit. You want to make sure your protection level is highest. And also important to note, you don't always need to wear your respirator and your suit. If you're going into a pure gamma radiation environment, a sealed source that doesn't give off any alpha and beta, you don't need a respirator. You don't need a protective suit. Uh, these are things you have to consider when you go operational. What is my threat? How to best prepare myself? Because every aspect of this does degrade your performance downrange. So there are two specific kit that I don't 
talk about in this briefing, but they're important to mention because they're similar applications. Uh, first up is the Astrorad. The Astrorad is our space solution. Uh, it's had an incredible journey. It's slightly different design, but it focuses on the same concept of selective shielding. Instead of a waist belt, it is a torso model. And instead of lead, it is hydrocarbon based. It's, it's a polymer and it weighs about 70 pounds, which you're in a microgravity environment in space. So it, the weight isn't as important. Uh, what we've done with that so far, we've been testing it with International Space Station. It's gone up for fit and feel in a microgravity environment. And in November of this year, it will be going to the moon. Uh, two phantom mannequins, these are mannequins equipped with internal dosimetry to show how the radiation will impact them, will be flying up. And one will be wearing an astrorad. And this is one of the final tests before we're on astronauts. And what's this? what this is going to give us is it's going to open deep space for us. Uh, it's going to make astronauts more survivable as they travel to the moon, to the, to Mars and beyond. And it's, it's really been a fantastic experience and it'll be great to see it go up to the moon. The second kit is the STEMRAD MD. And instead of being a selective shielding solution, what this is, is a, a wear solution. When you look at radiation interventionalists, they perform surgeries for several hours wearing a lot of lead because the patient's under constant x-ray so they can conduct these surgeries. Uh, what Stemmer has done is they've developed an exoskeleton that you wear that carries all that weight for you. So it's actually increased the radiation protection because it's a heavier suit, but all the weight's carried by the exoskeleton. So it saves your knees, your back, your shoulders. So they can also do longer surgeries and not suffer those injuries that they have been for years. Now, this is some more buy-in from, you know, the international community as they do studies on radiation accidents. You can see that there's a heavy lean towards selectively shielding the key organs, that red bone marrow, to protect responders. Because again, responders are going to go in. And, you know, the idea of shielding is not new. I'm sure everybody on the call has seen time, distance, and shielding. Time, you reduce your time on target. Distance, you stay as far away from the source as you can, and shielding. But what you have here with the 360, 360 Gamma, and the Astrorad is meaningful shielding you can wear and be operational. You can go down range and do your mission. And th this always leads me back to the EPA PAGs. We have taught people how horrible radiation is. And while a useful tool, there are some negative impacts for radiation. The protective action guides, the limits there, the thresholds we operate under are very safe sided. But the negative impact of that is we've taught people, instead of to respect radiation, to be scared of it. And we have to shift that mindset so we can go into these radiation environments, make ourselves safe, make ourselves more radiation resistant and function better. Now, we are fighting this construct of you know, time distance, no shielding involved, and it's, it's been an uphill battle. Getting everybody to talk about this, teaching people about selective shielding. But we've had a couple early adopters which has helped out. Nextera Energies, St. Lucie Power Plant, NASA, and Israel Space Agency working with the Astrorad. So we are making progress, and these have been some of the people that have helped us do it. More so, our partners. These are the, the organizations that continue to help us, along with BNC, to get the message out there that there are alternatives to just soaking up those rats. What I really want to paint the picture of is that the this, this Stemrad 360 selected shielding is not the end-all, be-all magic device. It is part of the holistic solution to addressing radiation problems with your respirator, your protective suit, your device, good detection. That is how you get this meaningful solution. And 
really when we tie that all together, you still get an operational capability of functionality that you can use, whether you're working in a lab where you're standing for long periods, this isn't going to degrade you. Whether you're doing operational response, emergency response, you have sufficient protection without losing that capability and that mobility and really supports our mission. We want to make humans more radiation resistant. I thank you very much for your time. I'm uh, ready for your questions, I believe. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I have to deliver one more quick message here about the Berkeley Nucleonics Academy. Firstly, thank you everybody who stayed with us during that exciting presentation on the 360 Gamma. If you're looking for educational materials outside of the scopes of these webinars, we have uh, what you see on this slide right here. These are courses that are structured in a listen format. You go through the listens, which include text, video, and image content, and you'll be able to learn more about properties like basic radiation detection identification, nuclear scintillators, neutron detectors, as well as some other fields that we uh, have equipment in. But with that out of the way, let's go ahead and approach some of these questions here. And uh, looks like to start, we have a question from Scott Goodman. He is asking about the, um, I might not pronounce this correctly, the Goiania Brazil incident where a medical device 137 cesium source was breached and the material spread. Would that have been seen as a collection of point sources or a cloud source? Uh, honestly, working in the environment, I would say that it would have been a cloud source because of how it was spread. It wasn't individual sealed sources packed up. Uh, so how you treat that contamination and, and major respiration inhalation hazard. All right. And then uh, just going back here a little bit to the early adopters, uh, Mick Castillo was asking if... Uh, if any major response jurisdictions are presently using the 360? Mostly in Florida. Uh, Nextera Powder Power is using them uh, at St. Lucie and Turkey Point. Uh, as far as civil authority, uh, Florida Fire Departments, several of them have them. All right. And uh, next question here is from Ji Zhang, and he is asking... Um, it, he, he would like access to the national lab report you were discussing along the course of the presentation. Yeah, what's the best way to get that to participants, Cody? Is that sent it to you? Uh, I will have one of our BNC agents here reach out to you, G, and um, we'll take down your information and get the conversation started via email. And uh, let me go ahead and check this other section here. Uh, all right. Moving on, we have a question from Martin Tornai, who is asking, is there any radiation detection and reporting built in? So we do put a variety of detectors on there uh, and mostly just chirpers that we put on there. I, I have a, a BNC Palmex on mine, um, but it's a pouch on the top because this is really just a, a lead vest with an actually really comfortable shoulder strap on it. Um, but no, nothing, no reporting tied into it. Uh, when we do exercises where we have live radiation, uh, we've been using, uh, some Bluetooth dosimetries called, I believe they're instadoses through University of Maryland and the, uh, radiation safety officer there manages that for us. All right. And uh, I think it's obligatory for me to mention that uh, BNC, if you're looking for detection and reporting, has multiple <laughs> multiple identifiers yes, that are mine. handheld. We have uh, backpack units um, if you're looking to stay hands-free. We also have pagers that are on the higher end for different types of emissions. And I believe that the 360 Gamma can actually fit one of those into a pocket, correct? Or Yes. I mean, there's yeah. a there's a pocket on there. Um, I, I don't see Oren on the line. If you are going to purchase a detector or this vest, I would highly recommend the detector first, uh, vest second. And, and that's simply because how you're going to manage it. You need to know when to wear this vest to, to get maximum capability. So I would always lean towards getting at least some detection 
not necessarily identification is needed, but some detection just lets you know you're in a radiation environment. So you know when to, to uh, get up. I think that's a very fair point. And um, uh, real quick, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get to the questions I see in chat. But just to quickly mention it to everybody, if you look up in chat, you'll see a message from one of my colleagues, Jordan, with a link to a survey. Um, and as well, it just popped up on the side. Uh, technology innovates every day. Uh, this will go ahead and uh, let you answer some questions, um, put in your thoughts, and provide important feedback to us as a webinar presenter. And moving forward, uh, here's another question from Martin, going through these as they come in. He's asking also, is it possible to build in radiation sensors to report when actual pelvic exposure is happening in a given scenario? Yeah, actually, and I forgot to mention this, there is a radiation detection card that is pressed up against your back in the vest. So it's inside the lead shielding of the belt, and it gives you a, a dose. And uh, when we sell them, I think we give a five-year supply of those cards with them. Um, but they're color metric, so when you get an exposure, you get a color metric dose reading. Excellent. And then, um, yeah, sorry, I was uh, jumping the slides around while you're answering that, Robert, but uh, G was actually wondering if we could go back to this slide. No, um, no questions. You just wanted to uh, review it again. But I do have a question from Mehdi Jabir, who's asking um, if you could talk briefly about the applications in diagnostic radiology. Would that be an area you can consider? The, the STEMRAD MD? Uh, really, that's that's one of our newest kits. And... I focus on the military and first responder. What I do know about it is it, it's still basic lead covering. It is a, a larger amount of protection with a, a face shield that also provides some uh, radiation protection. But the benefit is not in selective shielding. It's just full body shielding. The benefit is in the exoskeleton, which carries all of the weight. And it moves free flowing. If you visit our webpage, we have some great videos of a couple of the docs basically running down the hallway wearing, you know, I think it's close to 75 pounds of uh, protection. But uh, other than that, I really have to work through our medical context, each of that information. Sure thing. And um, next question we have here is from Thomas Bradley. Um, in consideration of the different form factors that people can have, would a woman in between her 20s to 50s require a different form of either the 360 gamma or 360 gamma light? So not necessarily the women. I also see the, ch the children. Is it just women? Women of childbearing age. Okay. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Not no. like pregnant, but in that yeah. age range, I think. No. No, um, the difference we ran into is for children. I believe it's uh, 10 and under. It's when they have more, more bone marrow in their skull than in their pelvis. So you really want to develop some kind of helmet thing, uh, which we briefly looked at when we were focusing on some bunker technology. Uh, but really, we don't want to push children into radiation environments. All right. Uh, fair enough. And a uh, quick question here and kind of doubling back. Uh, I have a question from Petru Obreja who is asking, uh, will you be developing full body radiation protection suits based on the technology in the 360 gamma, which I believe is something you're already addressing. But So we, we, uh, we looked at that and uh, with the army, there was some discussion about uh, increasing the torso model because of the impact other organs. But the problem is you start to get to the point where you have so much weight that there's no functional value to it. You might as well wear a tank. Um, you still need that functionality. Uh, but as far as your, your legs, your legs don't need a lot of radiation protection. Your legs just act as a good buffer to attenuate more, more ground scatter radiation. So not, not currently. For the Astro Red, which is our, our largest one, that is a full torso model itself. It doesn't go down below the upper portion of the leg. All right. And um, moving forward, uh, actually, now this slide has a, a pertinent question from G who is asking um, about the BM shielding efficiency factor, which I believe is the equation in the parenthetical. But can you go over a bit more about how that number is obtained and what it means? 
So no, actually, no, I can't. This is where the, uh, yeah. the engineers lose me. And uh, I'd have to bump you off to Orin uh, because that shifts differently from the transmission factor that I'm comfortable with from calculating in a tactical environment. Uh, All right. And uh, so, yeah, uh, G, that's another thing. When we um, reach out via email to you, make sure to include a note about uh, your curiosity into the BM shielding efficiency factor. And that's something we can uh, engage with you uh, further or send Redwell. And um, all right, Robert, this is typically a question that's uh, asked of our detectors, uh, scintillation detectors a lot, which is um, what is the effective temperature range for your 360 gamma suit? So all, all ranges of human life. It's actually fire resistant. The materials are fire resistant inside and uh, the lead as well. It's certified uh, for the European fire resistance schedule. I forget what the name is of it, but... Uh, all right. That's, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, so as mentioned, it's a wide range. And Alan, if you would like more information or if you have a specific scenario that is in your mind, feel free to add on or uh, get with us after the presentation. Uh, I have a question from uh, Vijay Karthik, who is... Uh, so one of the things we mentioned uh, when putting out the feelers for the webinar is that through the concepts of the 360 gamma, people would be able to learn about radiation protection at a general level, which I think is something that occurred. But uh, VJ is wondering if you could perhaps go over, say, just some of the basic radiation protection techniques for somebody in a situation who might not be with equipment, perhaps. Oh, are we talking a uh, like a um, nuclear detonation or a loose source? Let's go with um, a loose source here. Okay, so with a loose source, if you can identify that it's a source either through marking or you have some sort of detection, uh, distance is key. Uh, there's if you are uh, not prepared to deal with the environment, there's no reason to go into it unless there's somebody in a hazard. And the EPA PAGs actually cover this pretty well. Uh, you're unlikely to get a lethal dose if you have to run through that environment because of what types of sources we have globally and what you're going to see. Uh, if the package well, it shouldn't be a lot of radiation getting out. But if you are going to enter it and take care of a loose source for some reason, which I would never recommend unless you're trained, which is also part of the EPA guidelines. If you're going to exceed 25 REM, you need to fully understand the risk and have, be trained for that scenario. Um, distance, reduce your time, approach it as fast as you can and deal with it. Mitigate is what we would call it. So you cover it with lead blankets or other dense materials. Uh, water is really good. Um, in, in dire situations, uh, the human body is really good at shielding it. If you have fatalities, you would shield yourself from fa through fatalities and you would attenuate it. Uh, just really take me to a dark place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These scenarios do turn out a bit grim, but that's the importance of the equipment, right? Is uh, like you mentioned, making humans more radiation resistant because this is a very hard uh, presence to contend with in almost any scenario. So um, firstly, thank you, Susan. I see your comment and uh, we really appreciate being able to hand out this information in this webinar. Thank you for attending. And uh, we're gonna go ahead into the final phase of questions here. So if there is anything on, some, on your mind, feel free to ask, or if you're not able to ask it here, don't know how to phrase it, please feel free to get in contact with us. Um, our info link is here on this slide. Uh, I have a question from Sele who is asking, uh, what materials are used in the 360 gamma to protect against neutron rays? None specifically. There is uh, absolutely no claim made against neutron protection. Okay. And then um, going, uh, hearkening back to the uh, slide where you mentioned the partners, uh, there's a very uh, professional pedigree when it comes to who is using the 360 gamma. But let's say you're just somebody who wants to use it in a public sector or for personal use. Would there be a way to procure the equipment in that case? Uh, 
Absolutely. And you can get it direct through, you can get it through BNC, you can get it direct through STEMRAD and uh, it's flexible versions. The professional version, which is for first responders is uh, Kevlar. It's bullet resistant to a level uh, three alpha, I believe, which is 45 caliber. Um, and, and it comes with other kit that you can strip out if you don't want it. Or you can go to the professional model, but no, there's there's no limitation on it because this doesn't give you a uh, what we would consider a tactical threat. Uh, it's just prote it's protection, and we're willing to give anybody who wants it protection. Yep, and uh, definitely uh, since this is Ellen again, definitely do get with us with that application. Uh, Susan in Q and A mentioned uh, there's definitely a curiosity about your uh, general public use, but as Robert mentioned. This is uh, not a threatening unit. So if you do want one, you can certainly get one for your business or facility or anywhere else that you are. And with that though, it looks like we're actually slowing down a bit on the questions. Uh, Robert, this would be an excellent time for any final thoughts or anything you want to put out there. Um, and after that, I'll see if we have any more questions and then we'll uh, go ahead and call it. Well, we, uh, we did touch on loose source, and what we didn't talk about is any kind of explosion, uh, improvised nuclear device, or uh, weaponized nuclear device. Uh, hopefully, neither one happens, but they're both, they're both essentially the same. The IND is going to be a lot dirtier. Uh, your your follow-on hazards are going to be your inhalation hazard, but after a blast, you really, you really want to get into protection. And that protection, it could simply be get away from your walls and windows. Uh, the best place is a basement. And if that's not possible, a swale, a culvert. Uh, again, gamma radiation works like a, a flashlight. You want to hide from the light so you get the least amount of penetration possible. Uh, concrete, lead, dense materials, earth, water, those kind of things. And... Once the blast, which you get your blast wave, and then all that stuff's going to come right back. So you don't want to jump out too early. But once that all settles down, you really want to focus on getting out of the environment because the fallout is, is really nasty as far as the inhalation hazard and the gamma contamination. So you want to leave. Don't eat and drink. Just leave the environment as far as you can. Excellent. And uh, thank you, Lavik, for the kind words. We're glad it was informative. And Martin, thank you for your questions. They were very interesting. And thank you for your attendance. Thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar. Uh, we definitely hope to have more opportunities in the future to go over these more procedural and operational uh, facets of radiation. Um, usually, we do things like nuclear detectors and neutron detectors and uh, this was a really good chance to kind of get into the emergency response aspect of this field. Thank you very much to you, Robert, for being so informative and on top of the questions. And uh, with that, I think we're just about ready to close. Uh, thank you again, uh, everybody who participated. And thanks for having me. Of course.